Okay, um, recording in progress. So then we should be okay to set um, to be to be starting. Okay, so hi everyone. To welcome to the Qbit community meeting. It's the twenty uh, eighth of August, um, twenty four. Um, first of all, I would want everyone. Um, to share their attendance if they want. So let me see if I find the chat somewhere. There, there it is. Okay. Um, I'm going to post the uh, meeting document link into the chat right now. Um, so please go ahead and join um, and, and um, add your attendance here into the document, please. While we are at that, um let's start with the introductions um so first of all if you want to join the community um you have a couple of options um first of all you can as an organization you can add yourself to the adopters markdown which um gives you the opportunity to um to add yourself um, as a user um, of Qbert in either way, like um, if you also um, are a heavy user uh, from a company, for example, you might want to want to add yourself there. Um, other than that, you can follow us on Twitter um, and take a look at our community page so that um, you can find um, like links to the calendar and links to uh, all the remaining documents and user guides and everything else there, which should be a good start. And finally, if you want to contribute, um, please um, take um, the opportunity to join as a GitHub project member um, so that you um, receive the benefits of running your uh, pull request, uh, pre-submit um, jobs, which um, help you um, identify problems inside the PRs, um, which only Qbert community members uh, will have as a benefit. So uh, my call now, do we have any new members this week that want to introduce themselves to the other community members here? Okay, so I figure that is a no. Um, then um, I would want to um, go first of all to the schedule. Um, so, quick, uh, yeah, sure. Go sorry, ahead. sorry to interrupt. Uh, I saw Alice, I believe I'm now pronouncing her name, her name correctly. Uh, definitely added herself to the agenda for she she wanted to give a talk today i believe that's still the case and secondly your screen is very zoomed in it feels like we're just seeing the uh up to the introductions line of the agenda oh okay um so let me see if i can correct that somehow um wait a second let me try to Try to move that somehow. So let me try with it. Is yeah, I don't know why the client is doing that actually. Um, so I could probably like uh, full screen it and but yeah, seems Much to better. be not doing anything. Does it? It was a little bit. Yeah, it's better uh, if you could center the page somehow. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. How to do that? So yeah. Is that is that better? So um, it's a I'm little just better. trying to fiddle around with it. Oh wait a second, let me try to increase. Oh, That's it's, better. It's really? not perfect, but it's much better. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry for that. Since, like I said, I have the problems with the Zoom client. It's not doing what it should do. Yeah. That's why I'm normally not using it. But otherwise, we wouldn't be able to record the meeting. 
Um, so, um, again, uh, let's, uh, so Mark, um, was that everything that you wanted to ask? Um, are we set now or? Yeah, this is better. Okay, good. Then let's, uh, refocus on the, uh, on the agenda. So, um, we are currently at the stage where we have added the 131 pre-submits as, um, as running always. Um, so everyone uh, might be might have noticed that yesterday the 128 lanes have been going away. Now we are testing against 129 to 131 only, and 131 is not yet voting, which will be the next stage, which will occur um, soonish if they are um, like stable enough. The periodics are stable already, very much stable. So I think that will be a couple of days uh, when we make them mandatory. Okay, so, um, but we have a bit of time. We just set the milestone for CI lands for provider being voting like and on the 10th of September. So uh, we are still good, in good shape here. Okay. Um, So um, next would be the upcoming call for papers check-in. Um, let me see what is there. Um, there is two uh, conferences um, that we um, that we have on the page. One has already been happening. The next up is the Container Days in Hamburg, Germany, which will happen on the third to fourth of September. I can highly recommend that one. So um, actually, I'm not uh, sure who is going to host that. Let me take a quick look. Elephant in the room. Oh, I don't, can't see it. Does anyone else have uh, information about the elephant in the room? Who is holding that? No, sorry. OK. OK, all oh, good. I think. Um, yeah, um, this should be still something interesting. Um, so then, um, my talking too long again, um, then uh, I am pretty much sure that I will completely not pronounce your name right. I figure it's Sibashish. Um, is that somehow correct? So I was asking for the presentee who will um, present us the, uh, the GSOC project. That's Alice. Uh... Ah, I thought uh, I thought no, Sibashi. Yeah, let let yeah. me introduce. Um, so um, this is the second year that we are participating to uh, the Google Summer of Code. Um, so actually, we have two projects. Uh, one has been mentored by Lugo and uh, Antonio, and the other one is mentored by me and Victor. And today we are going to present one of them. So Sebastian is the one who is going to present this. And yeah, it's about persistent device claim using using um, dynamic resource allocation API from Kubernetes. Um, so it will last uh, about around 20 minutes. So I think Sebastian, if you don't have any issue, uh, would you like to share your screen? Um, stage sure, Alice. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Absolutely. Hello and welcome. Thank you. I'm going to stop my sharing. Um, if anyone has the um, a hint on how uh, I can enable Sibashish to share his window, that would be great advice. Mark, oh, there it is. He started already. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. I can see his desktop. OK. That's a good one. And now we see the slideshow. Excellent. So hi everyone, my name is Subhashish Vera and uh, I am a student and I'm currently contributing to Keyboard uh, in the Google Summer of Code program and 
I'm working on DRA PCA driver and keyboard. And the mentors for the project are Alice Rossi and uh, Victor Tosu. Uh, so let's dive in. Before uh, getting to know more about uh, DRA, dynamic resource allocation, let's first have a uh, look on how Keyword actually exposes its device right now. Uh, so Keyword has this permitted host device section where you can define the vendor selector and resource name in Keyword CR. This is something that the admin does. And after that, while defining the virtual machine, uh, the user can point the uh, device in the host device section. And uh, it does so by using the device name. So if uh, it has the same device name, it, uh, it uh, finds a suitable vendor selector and then allocates to that. So this is how uh, host devices work. Under the hood, uh, it is something that is managed by uh, a component in keyboard called the word handler, which is a daemon set. And its task is to uh, discover devices and allocate it using the device plugin framework. So uh, device plugin framework uh, is great, but there are some limitations to that. Uh, let's take a look. Mm -hmm. So the device plugin framework that is used in word handler uh, do not have a deallocation API, so there is no possibility of cleanup or resets. Uh, it's especially problematic because in devices like FPGAs and some persistent uh, data devices, cleanups are an important part and uh, it, it is a time consuming thing. So uh, there's an issue in that. And the other thing is uh, when we try to uh, restart a virtual machine, there is a possibility that some other randomly assigned uh, uh, a device can be randomly assigned. For example, we have a virtual machine VM1 running and it has a device PCI1. Uh, there might be a case that when it restarts, uh, it can get allocated uh, PCI2. So there, uh, there is an issue. Usually, uh, usually devices are stateless, but in some cases where uh, the initia initialization process is, uh, is huge, uh, this causes a lot of trouble for the users. And to overcome this, uh, we are using a solution from Kubernetes itself. It's a new API called the Dynamic Resource Allocation, or DRA. It's introduced uh, since Kubernetes 1.26. So this is kind of developed by uh, Intel and NVIDIA folks, mostly to uh, work on their uh, GPU models. But it can be extended. Uh, uh, to any kind of device, and we, are, we will be using that as our first uh, stepping stone in keyboard for host devices, and that uh, that is uh, for PCI devices specifically. So, dynamic in for to support dynamic uh, resource allocation, we kind of uh, make a resource driver, and uh, it consists of two two components. One is a node local uh, keyboard plugin. And another is a cluster level uh, DRA controller. So these uh, work together in sync with the API scheduler, uh, API server in the Kubernetes. And uh, the Kubernetes API server communicates with the scheduler to make the decisions. Uh, with that, it actually kind of tries to mimic uh, what we have in volume or uh, uh, specifically uh, PVC. So PVC persistent volume claim is this process in which uh, the admin can declare some kind of storage class and uh, the user can specify a uh, persistent volume claim or persistent volume template. So DRA tries to bring that same analogy in uh, for a uh, user API uh, for uh, uh, devices. And we uh, do that using resource claim and uh, resource claim uh, template as well as resource uh, resource class. If we go a little under the hood, uh, it actually uses a separate object called port scheduling context. And uh, it uses that to pass through all the nodes and get the data about the devices and make some scheduling decisions. We will have a better look at it uh, in some upcoming slides. Um, so how does GRA actually solve uh, device plugin framework issues? First, 
it has a deallocate api so now we can actually uh, now we can actually uh, get uh, make make some uh, uh, reset and uh, clean clean up programs included while uh, a resource claim is or resource uh, device is being uh, deallocated we can take care of that using deallocate api another is a uh, basic kubernetes scheduler uh, Kubernetes scheduler uh, works in the in in a way that uh, the device plugin framework actually only updates the device state if uh, allocate or deallocate uh, API is used. So in some cases there are discre discrepancy in the actual state of the devices and what uh, DP framework. This is uh, not the case uh, DRA because it uses the controller and the uh, cluster level controller and the uh, node local Kubernetes plugin. So it refreshes it continuously to get the state uh, updated and passes it to the uh, cluster controller. Another thing is that which we talked about is that uh, devices are randomly allocated sometimes in uh, DP framework when uh, VM is started. Uh, this will not the not be the case if we use resource claim uh, because resource claim uh, can be uh, reserved for pods. In this case, it can be reserved reserved for uh, the word launcher pod and hence the uh, VM. So uh, if, even if the VM uh, restarts, it can get the same uh, resource. So how does actually DRA PCI driver work? It uh, it it basically we we need to take care of two pieces of orchest orchestration and uh, one of them is actually giving the access to devices in the word launcher port and another is how word launcher port uh, uses it in libert theme process. Uh, the word launcher port uh, can be given access to the device using the DRA PCI driver. So what it actually does is uh, Libert has a mechanism in which the Libert Kimu process can actually get access to devices through the uh, through the environment variables. In the environment variable, we can store the PCI address and other kind of address. And uh, what DRA PCI driver does is it uh, uses the CDI or container device interfaces uh, and uh, while allocating a resource claim, uh, while allocating a resource claim, it actually tells the container runtime to include the specific data about device uh, in the compute container of uh, the word launcher port. And by doing so, it passes the environment variable, which can now be picked up by libword chemo process. And uh, this part is already existing and used by word handler. So that was not new addition. Coming next, how would the admin facing API look like? As I said, it is kind of an analogy to the persistent volume claim API. So instead of a resource storage class, we have something called resource class. In resource class, we can uh, reference a class parameters. And in the class parameters, we can define what is the resource name and uh, what is the vendor selector we are using and what kind of device it is. And this is an array, so we can uh, declare a lot of uh, these. And this kind of mimics uh, what we do right now in keyword CR in permitted uh, post events. For the user part, uh, the user would be actually uh, making use of something called resource claim. In the resource claim, we can reference a claim parameter. Uh, the claim parameter would contain the device name, like what is the device that we need to use. In this case, it's a NVMe device. And uh, this resource claim would actually be referenced in a VMI object. In the VMI specification, we can uh, have a resource claim uh, section. We have resource claim section under host devices, where we can point to the source of the uh, resource claim, uh, which we are doing here test claim, test PCI claim. Uh, for this change, we are actually using a fork of uh, keyword that uh, uh, that is maintained in uh, draft PR because uh, it's still in beta, uh, the DR API. So we 
we thought it would be best to not integrate it directly. Uh, I will be sharing the link later in the references. So how does actually DRA work and uh, what it does in Qcode? Uh, the first part is admin. Admin deploys the resource class. Admin also deploys the whole DRA PCI driver, which contains a, contains a centralized controller and a Kubernetes plugin. Uh, and then the next part would be the user. The user would be declaring a resource claim and would pointing that resource claim in the Kubernetes VMI object. And uh, after that, what would actually happen is uh, the scheduler will uh, get get the uh, pod object that uh, pod, pod is trying to be, get scheduled. So it will generate a potential node. Obviously, initially, it would be all the set of uh, nodes which are present on the cluster, which have the uh, resource in terms of memory and CPU, et cetera. And it would create an object called the pod scheduling object. So this pod scheduling object is important because it acts as, uh, as the only piece of communication between the vendor specific uh, DRI PCI driver and the scheduler. So it will uh, it will send the potential nodes through a pod scheduling. The pod scheduling will be picked up by centralized controller. It will re-verify that does this node contain the device that are mentioned in the keyword uh, VMA object uh, through resource screen. And it will verify, and if it's present, uh, it will send what are the nodes which can supply these kind of devices. So this is kind of a loop process, the 3.2, 3.4, and 3.3, until we get uh, one definite node that, uh, uh, that in this node, we have the devices that are requ requested in the Qubit VM. After this, um, after that, we have generated a potential node. Uh, we can actually start the scheduling process. What Keyword does is it uh, it sets the node in the resource claim object. Now the resource claim object uh, has the node part, and it also sets the node in the port scheduling part. The port scheduling part is picked up by centralized controller, and the centralized controller then. Uh, then also uses the information from a resource claim allocation and passes the resource claim allocation information in the port scheduling context. Now the now in the port scheduling context, uh, we have the resource claim information and the node information. And after that, uh, we can actually point the resource claim to the word launcher port. The word launcher port then actually accesses the resource claim and makes it a part of uh, its specification. And after that, the keyword uh, keyword word launcher pod is scheduled. So this is how the Kubernetes part works. Now you might be thinking, what does uh, DRA, uh, what does Kubelet plugin do? Because we saw that centralized controller is uh, being extensively used for communicating with scheduler to pod scheduling context. What Kubelet plugin does it? It tries to advertise the devices that are present in the uh, present in the node. It is a daemon set that would be running on every node. It picks up the devices that is present in this case PCI devices and advertises it to the centralized controller. The centralized controller then takes care of actually including it in a resource stream. After that, we can move on to the demo. As I mentioned, that we do not have integrated. Uh, uh, the changes that are required to be made in Qboard. Uh, we are maintaining that in a in a draft pull request, and uh, the DRA PCI driver itself is maintained uh, in a separate repo under Qboard called DRA PCI driver. Uh, the links would be provided uh, after that in the references. Uh, for the demo setup, we would be making use of emulated devices of size 1 GB and 500 M. We would be also uh, using k 1.30 and we would be using feature gate host devices and dynamic resource allocation. This feature gate is introduced in this uh, pull request in this fourth of keyboard. And, uh, after that, it's very classic. We would be syncing up the cluster and checking our interface. Let me start the video.
so the first part is we have to check the nodes that are present so we do it by using qc to get nodes we see that there is one node available node 01 then we ssh into it and we make sure that are all the nvme de devices that we planned for are present yes they are present as uh, present and we can see the pc address as well that is uh, the one highlighted and now we check that are those PCI devices actually bound by VFI PCI driver uh, so yes they are bound by VFI PCI driver mm. the next step would be actually deploying the DRA driver uh, it is a separate component and uh, we are in the de demo folder of that specific repository now let's try to deploy it So we have deployed it and we can see that there are uh, two pods, new pods running. One is the Kubelet plugin and another is the uh, controller. And uh, we will now try to uh, check if the PCI devices are listed. We will actually move on to work on the VMI deployment. Uh, in the VMI deployment, we will be referencing the PCI resource claim. As you can see under the host devices, we have something called uh, test PCI claim and it points to an object uh, resource claim that is declared above. Let me do that. Yeah. So here is the resource, uh, resource claim that we are pointing in the uh, virtual machine instance. After that, uh, we can deploy it. Uh, now that we've seen the VMI resource clean uh, template, and we can now actually deploy it in our keyboard setup. And let's try that. Yeah, we can see that the work launcher uh, VMI with NVMe is running. Uh, but we are not actually sure that does it contain the PCI device or not. So we have to look in the libword XML. Let's try that. We can also see that in the resource claim, we see a test PCI claim that is allocated and reserved. And uh, we also see the uh, see the NAS. NAS stands for node allocation state, which actually uh, which actually takes care of state management of the devices. It uh, it contains allocatable, prepared, and allocated resources. So we can see that. Uh, one PCI device has been allocated and that is being used by the word launcher for. We have one allocated claim and now we are going to check inside the word launcher pod to actually see if it uses the PCI device. So keyword a uh, word launcher pod has this mechanism where, where it dumps the file, the uh, leeward XML file in this 64 format. We can uh, grab that and uh, check if the device is present. If we scroll above, we will find a, a hash, which we can copy. So I'm copying the hash here. And we will now try to check for the host devices. Echo, we paste that and pipe it through base64. That's good. 
now we can check for the host dev keyword and we can see that there is a host dev present which is of pci device type and uh, which also uses the address that we we were looking for which was uh, uh, 000.00.00.0.0.7.0. .00 we can see that it's using that PC device. Yeah, and uh, that was the demo. Now, we can look on some known issues that are present in this implementation. Uh, the implementation uses a uh, approach in which uh, the Kubelet plugin, which is supposed to be node local, uh, get access to some, some uh, cluster level object like the uh, resource class parameters. So that is something we, we will change by using some kind of uh, uh, communication strategy through GRPC. And uh, the next thing that we're looking for is some new API changes in 1.30, Kubernetes 1.30. So these changes will actually el uh, eliminate the centralized controller in gear resource driver because the structure of the uh, centralized component is kind of same for every vendor specific resource driver. So Kubernetes have decided to eliminate that and use something called structured parameters to which uh, we will also get rid of something called uh, the NAS uh, node allocation uh, node allocation state uh, CRD, and there are also some minor uh, issues. We have to adjust the uh, Linux. Now we are using it through set n four zero. We will uh, try to solve that, and there are also some port security context warnings which we will uh, try to fix. And uh, uh, the implementation is still in beta and the API is also still in beta. Uh, so we didn't think that it would be wise to integrate in word, word handler itself. But we are planning that if we, if uh, DRA makes it to beta or uh, is more stable, we can try for that. And the future plans would also include supporting MDEV and uh, USB devices. The next thing we can move on to QA. If you guys have some questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you for the presentation and the demo. Uh, sorry. I was not able to listen. Can you please repeat? Oh, I just wanted to say thank you. That was wonderful. What was yeah, the, uh, what was, I have just one question. What was the, the most difficult part of this uh, that you had to learn or, or learn new skills to execute? Uh, the most difficult part was, I think, uh, navigating through the DRA API in Kubernetes, because uh, that was a huge code base. So I have to uh, look into that. And also, this is my first time working with keyboard. I have no prior experience with virtualization. So I learned a whole lot of things about virtualization and how actually uh, devices can be passed through in container and uh, the mechanisms that are used for that. So it was pretty interesting to learn. Excellent. Thank you. So another question that was posted by Itamar in the chat, um, there is, uh, he requested sharing the link to this presentation, but just as I see like um, Alicia already um, put the presentation link into, first of all, into the doc and second of all, into the chat. So um, everyone who wants to take a look again, please visit the community meeting document, document and um, or uh, grab the link from the chat. Yeah, and I can I can just only chime in and, and saying this has been a great presentation and a great 
amount of work. I think um, from from uh, my humble knowledge on uh, this must have been a grand effort. And uh, we, in, in the name of the community, I would like to thank you for that. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, it was really interesting for me and uh, the support from Keyword and especially from my mentors, uh, Alice and Victor. It has been incredible. So I would like to thank them. Thank you. Really cool stuff. So I think so there are. One. Sorry. Should I speak or? <laughs> Okay, yep, I, I will. Uh, I would just want to say that Sebas did a great work. It was a very complex topic, but it did it really did it very quickly. Um, so uh, you can see a PR from him uh, with some basic change uh, in in Cuba. So I want also to um, to highlight that there is um, a design proposal for from Ale uh, about uh, the array and how to support it in QWERT. So uh, the two, what he has done and the, this design proposal could actually be really a step forward for um, for introducing the array in QWERT because it, it can really solve concrete problems that we have, um, especially for NVMe and USB devices. Uh, this is, uh, we have strong limitation for that. Yeah, oh. I, I totally agree. I think uh, uh, in the in the evolving scenario, I think DRA is going to be something that would uh, completely replace the use use of DP framework, and it gives a pretty uh, in better uh, better management for device. So this is something uh, we would be looking. At. Okay, then, um, any other questions before we switch to the next subject? Okay, then, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen again. Thank you. I am uh, stopping my screen. So let me see. Yeah. I hope you can see my screen again. Yes, and uh, full screen. It looks good. Okay, that's good. Um, I'm going to try to move it a bit. So, okay, uh, that looks better, I think. Okay. Um, so since there is no other agenda note items, um, I would switch to the open floor. Um, so there's uh, two uh, questions from my side, which I noticed when I stumbled over a couple of PRs inside the Qubit Qubit repository. Um, question for me is there is, uh, like we counted last time we looked at, we saw 38 open SIG code quality PRs. Um, we um, had this topic earlier uh, where I was posing the question whether actually Code quality is a SIG or not, um, since uh, it's missing chairs, uh, it's not declaring chairs, and there is no one seeming to pick up on the code quality PRs with respect to reviewing them. So uh, let me pose the question again. Um, do we want to form like a real code quality SIG? Uh, which would then require to have chairs that would be chairing that SIG and team leads, for example? Um, or do we want to change the code quality label, the SIG code quality label to something like a type um, or, or uh, something else? Maybe kind. So, 
Yeah, I think, Stu, you wanted to talk. Yeah, I, but I found when I hear somebody else talk, the most effective thing is to just shut up. <laughs> Otherwise, we talk back and forth. Um, so the the it's not a concern about whether or not we would want to have the code quality marking. It's just that by calling it a SIG, it implies special meaning in terms of uh, a formal process. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what I was asking. So um, my understanding of a SIG is that it is somehow being guided by chairs. And we have had a couple of people like uh, stepping in as leads, for example, like Itamar uh, stepped in as, as a SIG compute chair, um, if I remember correctly. And uh, I myself am uh, one, a chair of the SIG CI. And so if we want, I mean, I, I think that a SIG of code quality would make sense. Um, but if we want something like that, then we should somehow should pick up the chair, the chairing of this um, and, and see that we can get this moving. Because um, I think there is some, some kind of responsibility lacking when it comes to looking at the code quality PRs. This, I mean, this uh, this is somehow indicated by that so many code quality PRs are open, and I don't see that much interaction on those. So um, this is not to blame anyone. I was just wanting to ask if someone is feeling like um, being up to leading the code quality effort and, and stepping in as chair for the SIG. Hey, Daniel. Uh... So in my opinion, uh, it shouldn't be a SIG actually, um, both because there is a huge overlap between code quality and basically everything else. So um, like a SIG chair anyhow needs to uh, take care of the code quality for, for, for its own domain, right? Um, so I, I don't think that SIG is the, is the right way to deal with it. Um, in terms of labeling, uh, maybe area or kind or something like that would fit. Yeah, I see. Like, there's there's two dynamics here. There's one which is, as Daniel's pointing out, a, a lack of who who like ownership's the wrong word. We all own it, but there there tends to be a lack of engagement uh, that should be there for a healthy setup. But but Edward, you raise a good point that doesn't a SIG then require or imply the existence of an owner's file, and and how would you even define that because it touches everything. Um, so, so I think, I think we should treat those issues separately though, because we'll, we'll, you know, we'll conflate them and confuse the, the issue. But overall, I think that we, it, it does kind of make sense to change it to a kind instead of a SIG, but we also, how do we then address the, the question of, um, engagement and getting people to participate? Um, Stu, what do you think about working group? Uh, we had one recently for, uh, yeah, then I know what, what I'm talking about. I, and I think that the definition of a working group is that it's like, a, uh, it's it's broad, it, it touches like uh, multiple things. So yeah, maybe it's the right way to go. Does a working group have clearly defined ownership or participation? I think that Daniel is currently working on PR regarding that. Let me find it out. Yeah, so actually working groups don't own code themselves. They have a clear goal. And um, from the Kubernetes perspective, they are like um, rather like uh, uh, like uh, will this solve when the issue is solved. Um, so the latter would point towards that this might not be a working group because it will not disband because code quality will be an issue that is ever present somehow. But still, um, that said, I think like a working group is still something that could help us in organizing at least because uh, another thing that working groups do is like they give a body of uh, uh, responsibility to some people that actually then can can uh, like get together and and uh, look at the issues that are there and somehow organize it and. I think that's actually what Stu is also pointing out that would somehow solve the issue of non uh, activity with when it comes to res uh, in, in respect to SIG code quality. Um, yeah. Can I just, uh, I mean, 
we can do a working group, but at the end, it, it's an approver that needs to to actually put a approve on that PR. So I don't know. I, I still think the, the real problem is that we are lacking approvers. So I don't know if we really need to. Do you really think we need a working group for that? I mean, we could define guidelines. Uh, so Felix already started, uh, and we have uh, a, a documentation uh, how the code should look like. So. Uh, if we find other things, we should edit that that file. But I don't know. I I don't think a working group is solving the issue. Daniel, could you please uh, clarify what is the difference in practice between a SIG and a working group uh, with regard to this issue? Because it sounds like the same. No, it's not. Um, while uh, SIG actually has clear ownership of uh, code, uh, a working group does not. Um, <clears throat> another aspect is that a SIG will stand in long term and have long term goals um, and, and follow uh, a set of goals um, for the lifetime of the project, while a working group would be a timely based um, uh, collaboration that would Besides that, spanning multiple uh, touch points um, of multiple SIGs, and a working group needs to communicate with a couple with with the SIGs themselves, and SIGs sponsor working groups. So um, I hope I did clarify the main issue or the main differences. Hopefully, good enough. Other than that, I would probably just add the uh, pull request that um, actually clarifies on that one uh, to the document later on, if you want. Thank you for the explanation. I just wanted to uh, raise a point that code quality will not end in a timely matter. It will be here for the rest of the project. So uh, yeah. we cannot say that we have uh, the code quality working group that will work until, I don't know, six months in the future. And then it will end. It is something that we should always have. Yeah, I agree absolutely. I think that that this will code quality will be an issue that will still stand out, which would rather then um, transfer to like this being a SIG. But on the other hand, it will be like um, it will span multiple SIGs because those are the owner of the code. So. This is, I think, a bit hard. So it might be neither a working group nor a SIG. And maybe it's just like a type that is applicable to a pull request itself um, or, a, or a kind uh, like of, of, uh, of marker, maybe. So to sum it up, the problem with calling it a SIG is that it doesn't have an owner's file or there's just no sensible way to apply that to the code. And the problem with calling it a working group is that those are usually time boxed and this isn't. Yeah, I would say it is exactly like that. So um, I don't know if we need like... Uh, to decide it right now, um, I would probably um, send again an email to the, or, or do we have an agreement from maintainers probably who are uh, attending the call um, that would probably vote to change the uh, label rather to a kind um, label or an area label. I think it would be rather kind because I think uh, a kind of a pull request um, uh, definitely um, defines um, a type, which which I think makes sense here. Yeah, and that would also enable um, triage during the community meetings. Yeah, good point. Good point. I second the motion on that then. I would then be. Uh, 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 would be uh, happy to create the pull request that changes the label if you are okay with that. Yeah. 
Nobody. I think it's a, <laughs> nobody's opposing it. It's true. I, I just, I'm thinking on it. Uh, it. There's zero problem with creating the PR and starting the discussion, uh, which, which, which is obviously what we're doing here. Um, I just need time to think. I know the maintainers are meeting uh, today, so I can approach and re-raise this at that forum and see if it, that's, uh, if they gain traction or if people just think we're overthinking it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a fair point against the SIG label is that like n no one is actually like um, leading the SIG uh, and sharing it. So that on its own would be uh, like a uh, like a pointer for the maintainers to disband the SIG if it so since it doesn't exist. So yeah, I would say, um, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I lost my point. Um, okay, then any other opinions on that topic? Just uh, before we close and go to the next one. Okay, um, I think that's enough. Then uh, next issue um, uh, that I that I saw was also that we are seeming to lack community um, approvers. Um, it's a bit selfish probably for me to point that out because I also have a couple of community PRs open that are lacking approver, uh, approvers to look at this. Um, but when I looked at that, I saw um, that there is like at the moment, there is uh, like 28 PRs open um, of which uh, a couple of these are LGTM'd, um, which points me towards um, that people, that, that we might need more uh, reviewers with approver rights on the community repository. Um, Jed fairly pointed out that he has been added as a reviewer for the community uh, repository, I think like three years ago, and he's asking probably to get approval status also, Idamar um, has opened a PR for with another ask, like um, adding the global approvers of the Qbert Qbert uh, repository also as uh, to the as being approvers of the community repository, which both are I think fair asks. Um, uh, I would just uh, ask for opinions on this call probably um, right now. What do you think? Okay, then I'm just going to um, put the wait a second, where is it? There it is. Um, put the links to the uh, pull requests also into the chat so that you can have a look. <laughs> yes, Alicia, since you also are not approver, I think that is like sad. But yeah, so um, let's then uh, try to discuss this on the community pull requests probably. But yeah, so um, I would really want to um, have maintainers also have a look at that. And I don't think, I didn't see any maintainer here at least, um, besides you, but um, since you didn't speak up, I think you don't have, a, have an opinion on that one. There's a difference in not speaking up and um, not having looked at it yet. So I would need to investigate. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, sorry for that. I didn't want to like uh, pull you in. All is well, but no, I did. I did not speak up. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay then. Um, oh, I see. We are just five minutes um, to the border of our meeting. Um, I would then still try to get a couple of pull requests that need attention uh, to your uh, that we can so that we can talk about those um, quickly. Um, so this one is by Jan Shintag, 
Um, Jan, are you there? Do you want to do you want to share something on that one? Yeah, I can just share briefly. I mean, it's basically just adding the section for adding uh using nightly builds for SV90X since it's already there for ARM. Um, I considered doing that more general, so you had like select your arch, but that would I think make it needlessly complicated. Hmm. Okay. So it's just copying ARM section and replacing the arch. Okay, I think I can. Um, I have approval rights in the user guide, so I might be uh, able to help out. So I'm just yeah. um, going to um, see, see myself on this one. Um, yeah, but maybe Victor will also have an opinion on that one, but I'm, I'm not sure whether he has time to look at this. So let's see. Okay, the next one is uh, by Javier. Um, I'm just going to open it real quick. And uh, Javier, if you want to want to chime in on this one, please go ahead right now. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, basically, this is a design proposal for uh, graduating a, a future that are dropping the future gates as a mechanism to enable or disable the future itself. So since we would like to get rid of future gates, uh, we are proposing how the future configurable should work and should in interact on be or behave with the system. And we are looking for a feedback in, uh, and input on this one. So please, if you have some time, and we got there already uh, a lot of feedback, but uh, all of them is highly appreciated. So please, if you have some time, uh, go ahead and take a look and drop some comments. Thanks. Okay, um, so we have two minutes left. So let me try to spend that on the next one. Um, this is a refactor, test refactor for the migration update emitter. Um, Aurel, uh, I think this is yours. Yes, yeah, so this one is uh, refactoring the unit tests of this uh, specific admitter. The raises the code quality a bit, and it also is linked with the next uh, PR uh, by ID. And I don't want to take his time, so this PR is already LGTM'd, looking for an approval. Okay, then, um, then I think we can take a look at that one. I'm not sure if. The author is here. Um, yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah, okay. As Azarel said, uh, it's pretty much the same as uh, his PR, just this one for the migration create emitter. Uh, this cleans up the uh, code a bit, uses the fake client instead of uh, GoMock and the uh, previous uh, ver client. And uh, yeah, looking uh, for an approver as well. Okay, so this is from Kubert. Kubert. I can can't step in for that one. I'm sorry for that. But anyone else? Um, did you ping some uh, other approvals besides Vladik um, already on the PR? Let me see. I have not. Those were uh, automatically assigned. Oh, ah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. So it might make sense. Probably, um, Edomar, would you have time to? To look at this. Um, yeah, sure. Can you see me in the PR? Sure, sure. Thanks for that. Sure, no problem. And with that, I see we are at the end of our meeting time. Um, so I would give uh, anyone who wants to have a last remark on this meeting just a short opportunity to, to do this. Okay, with that, then um, we are just ending our meeting right on time. Thanks everyone for your attendance. Thanks for the great presentation, Shibashish. 
Um, and yeah, happy to have you all here. Um, see you in the next community meeting. Have a great week. Until then. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye. Thank you.